Thank you, Father Nelson. It was on April 5th of the 1997 national meeting of the Institute on Religious Life that I heard the servant of God, Father John Anthony Hardin of the Society of Jesus, speak about a new apostolate which he was establishing for the spiritual and doctrinal formation of catechists. Although I had known the servant of God from his many and most helpful writings, especially regarding catechetics, I had never met him or spoken with him. On that Saturday morning, because of the many faithful who wanted to speak with him, and my need to return to the Diocese of La Crosse to ordain a seminarian to the Order of Deacons, I was unable to speak with Father Hardin. I had been a bishop for two years and some months. Among the greatest of my many concerns for God's flock in my care was the state of catechesis. The fruits of decades of inadequate and even false catechesis had left many of the faithful in confusion and error about the Church's fundamental teachings regarding faith and morals. Eucharistic faith and devotion were shockingly diminished from what they had been during my childhood and youth. Many Catholics no longer considered participation in the Holy Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation to be an essential duty of their Catholic faith. A great number of Catholics had abandoned altogether the sacrament of confession. Indifference regarding the practice of the Christian virtues and confusion and error regarding the moral law were working destruction upon married life and the family and leading to widespread moral corruption among children and young people. The situation was made even worse by the alienation from catechesis of those who have the first responsibility to catechize parents and parish priests. Catechesis had somehow become the exclusive domain of what was called the catechetical establishment. Catechists no longer assisted parents and parish priests in carrying out their responsibility for catechesis, but replaced them. Many of the so-called professional catechists lacked a proper doctrinal and spiritual formation for participation in the fundamental and irreplaceable catechetical mission of the Church. You can imagine then with what consolation and enthusiasm I listened to the servant of God's presentation on what was to become the Marian Catechist Apostolate. Along with his presentation, Father Hardin gave each of us a printed sheet with a summary of what he was proposing for the apostolate on behalf of catechists and with his mailing address so that anyone interested could make further inquiry. Within a matter of days, I wrote to Father Hardin, explaining to him my grave concerns and asking him to help me to introduce the Marian Catechist Apostolate into the Diocese of La Crosse. Somehow, I had the idea that the apostolate was already fully developed and that it would simply be a matter of introducing it in its developed form into the diocese. <laughs> Experiencing directly the servant of God's spiritual legacy. What I did not realize was that by my letter, I was about to join Father Hardin in the development of the Marian Catechist Apostolate. <laughs> After Father's death, one of his faithful volunteer co-workers told me that on the morning when Father Hardin received my letter, he exclaimed, I have my bishop. From that time forward until Father's death on December 30th of the great Jubilee year 2000, I was privileged to work closely with him in the development of the Marian Catechist Apostolate. To be honest, 
It was demanding work. When I wrote my letter to Father Hardin, I had, as the saying goes, no idea of what I was getting into. <laughs> but more importantly, it permitted me to work closely with an extraordinarily holy Jesuit priest in order to be a more faithful shepherd of God's flock. Becoming involved with Father Hardin in the development of the Marian Catechist Apostolate, I came also to know a number of other apostolates of which Father Hardin was the founder or one of the founders. For example, the Institute on Religious Life, the Real Presence Eucharistic Education and Adoration Association, and Eternal Life. After his death, another apostolate, which he had in mind to found, was brought to birth as he had desired, and surely with the help of his intercession, the Father John A. Hardin S.J. Media Apostolate. It was a great blessing to get to know Father Hardin and to work with him in the apostolate. Through him, I also came to know his many volunteer co-workers who, inspired by his example, gave themselves faithfully and tirelessly to the work of the new evangelization, to the work of teaching and living the Catholic faith with the enthusiasm and energy of the first disciples, of the great saints like St. Ignatius of Loyola, and of the missionaries who first brought the Catholic faith to our land. They continue to follow the inspiration and direction which the servant of God gave to them. I have dwelled upon the story of my meeting and working with Father Hardin because it is the principal font of the reflection which I now offer on his lasting legacy. Working with Father Hardin, I came to understand the great gift which he was for the Church the gift which is his lasting legacy and which we are celebrating in these days. The source of the lasting legacy. Before reflecting on the details of Father Hardin's lasting legacy, we must first ask, what is the source of the lasting legacy which we have received from the servant of God, Father John Hardin? The answer, is quite simple. The source is a person, our Lord Jesus Christ, alive in his mystical body, the Church. Working with Father Hardin, I have often thought of the words of St. Paul in communicating the truth of the institution of the Holy Eucharist. St. Paul wrote in the first letter to the Corinthians, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There was never any doubt in Father Hardin's mind that he belonged totally to Christ, who had ordained him to the priesthood. He desired only one thing in his life, that is, to remain faithful to Jesus Christ, also if such fidelity would demand a martyr's death. He wanted to leave only one legacy, his priesthood in Jesus Christ. In the sermon which he preached on June 18, 1997, the 50th anniversary of his priesthood ordination and his 83rd birthday, Father Hardin described his entire priestly life as the struggle to be faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ. He declared, I could talk, 
not for hours or days, but months, on what I've learned during my 50 years in the priesthood. Only God knows the price I have paid to be faithful to Jesus Christ. But, what an important adversative, but, I share this with you from the depths of my soul. I've also learned to trust in Jesus Christ, to hope in his grace, in a word, to be confident. Father Hardin's words communicated the humility of one who desired to serve his divine master with all his being, even though he was deeply conscious of his weaknesses. The servant of God humbly spoke of trying to be faithful, of the struggle to be faithful. At the same time, he expressed the confidence of one living in deep communion with his master, trusting that notwithstanding the forces from within and the forces from without, which try to discourage and confuse our efforts to be faithful, Christ accompanies us and gives us the grace to be faithful. At the conclusion of the same homily, the servant of God pleaded for prayers for priests, that priests may be priests not only in name but in reality. He described a real priest with these words, a real priest is one who loves Jesus crucified. A real priest is one who loves nothing more, and I mean every syllable. This is Father Hardin talking. <laughs> who loves nothing more than to suffer out of love for Jesus who ordained him. A real priest is a living martyr. Father Hardin went on to speak about the temptations against the faith and temptations against chastity which assail priests and which would hinder them in their mission to be channels of the grace of faith to those who depend on their priestly ministry. The servant of God concluded his plea for prayers for priests by speaking about his own prayer. And I quote from my first mass at every consecration for the grace of martyrdom. He then pleaded, pray that we priests, if it is God's grace, die a martyr's death, that we might live, all of us, a martyr's life. From the words of Father Hardin, it is clear that for him, in accord with the teaching of the church, being a priest meant being totally for Christ, a ceaselessly faithful witness to Christ who is present to his church as head of his body, shepherd of his flock, high priest of the redemptive sacrifice, teacher of truth. The priest, by the grace of holy orders, acts in the person of Christ the head in persona Christi Capitis. Rightly, then, the ordained priest prays daily for the grace to be always a white martyr and to be ready to be a red martyr should fidelity to Christ require it. The font of Father Hardin's lasting legacy is Jesus Christ who ordained him, who configured the servant of God to himself, the high priest, from the words of the servant of God and from the direct experience of his priestly ministry, it is clear that what he has handed on to us is what he first received from Christ, our high priest. I would now like to speak about two channels of the divine font of his lasting legacy. First, his parents. Who were the instruments by whom 
the servant of God came to know Christ so intimately and was helped to respond with an undivided heart to Christ's call to the priesthood. From his parents and his teachers, especially his teachers in the Society of Jesus, Father Hardin came to a deep knowledge and love of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is alone our salvation. He came to a deep knowledge of how our Lord Jesus Christ remains with us always in his mystical body, the Church. And Father Hardin grew always more in his love of Christ in the Church. Father Hardin first came to know Christ through his parents. Although his father, John, died when he was just one year old, he communicated Christ to his only son by the devout fa Catholic family life which Anna, his wife, and he had established in their home and by the heroic manner of his death. At the age of 27, his father was killed instantly by falling from a scaffold on which he was standing to perform an act of charity for a co-worker. Although Father Hardin had lost so soon the earthly company of his father, the spiritual company of his father remained with him, directing him always to give all to Christ. Regarding his mother Anna, Father Hardin declared in his sermon on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of his priesthood ordination, I never once remember my mother never missing Mass or Holy Communion every day of her life. Holy people are not only an example of sanctity to others, oh no. Holy people are channels of grace to others. I am speaking to all of you and through you to tens of thousands of professed Roman Catholics. In the name of Jesus Christ, live lives of close union with God. In the depth of his being, Father Hardin understood that the greatest gift which his parents had given to him was knowledge and love of our Lord Jesus Christ, especially of his real presence in the most blessed sacrament. As his words express, his dear mother, by her close union with our Eucharistic Lord, became a channel of divine grace for him. Offering the example of his mother, the servant of God reminded all of us that Christ pours out the Holy Spirit into our hearts from his glorious pierced heart so that from our hearts rivers of living water may flow forth for our brothers and sisters for the salvation of our world. Time does not permit the deeper analysis of the influence of Father Hardin's parents, relatives, and other teachers of the faith. It is my hope that soon a biography or biographies of the servant of God will permit us to view more directly how parents, relatives, and teachers were true channels of the life of Christ within him. The second channel of the font of the, of the divine font, the Society of Jesus. The second major font of the lasting legacy of the servant of God is the formation of his mind and heart in the society of Jesus. Father Hardin was, in my judgment, the quintessential Jesuit. He understood deeply the meaning of the name of his religious community, the Society of Jesus, namely a body of men united unconditionally in love of Jesus Christ and thereby forming a body, a core, at the service of Christ in accord with the indications of the Roman pontiff, Christ's vicar on earth. 
It should be noted that St. Ignatius of Loyola and his first companions identified themselves as the Compagnia di Jesus, which was translated into Latin, Societas Jesu, and in English, the Society of Jesus. A more literal translation in English, the Company of Jesus, underlines perhaps better the intimacy of the communion with the Master, which the members sought from the first days of the foundation. St. Ignatius of Loyola, founder of the Society of Jesus, proposed for his followers a total dedication to the mission of Christ rooted in a contemplation of the mystery of Christ, God the Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, made man. The spirituality of the Society of Jesus as handled down by St. Ignatius of Loyola, is founded on the communion with our Lord Jesus Christ, to God the Son incarnate, by which we with him and in the grace of the Holy Spirit give glory to God the Father. The Christian, as St. Ignatius experienced in a profound way in his own life, is called to a daily, a constant conversion to Christ, to become a new man in Christ. Father André Ravier, in his biography of St. Ignatius of Loyola, has written this commentary on the various names given to the spirituality of the founder of the Jesuits. To this spirituality, different names were given in the course of time. Contemplative in action, service and praise of God our Lord, for the greater glory of God, with Jesus Christ to serve, miles Christi, spirituality of the Magis, third degree of humility. It is certain that each of these formulas on the condition that it be understood with intelligence and not isolated, expresses a very important aspect, if not an essential one, of Ignatian spirituality. In fact, the spirituality of St. Ignatius of Loyola embodies a deeply personal knowledge and love of Jesus Christ, through, with, and in whom one comes to know God the Father, to love him, and to serve him. Communion with our Lord Jesus Christ in the knowledge, love, and service of the Father means giving ourselves always more in love, loving to the end as Christ loves. The metaphor of the Christian as soldier of Christ, a miles Christi, is most apt, for the Christian dedicates himself totally to Christ, always ready to lay down his life for Christ and his mystical body, the Church. It is a spirituality of magis, of giving oneself always more, more completely. It is a spirituality which inspires the desire and effective action of dying always more to self, of depending completely upon God the Father, and of giving always the greater glory to him. Concluding his description of the spiritual way taught by St. Ignatius of Loyola, Father Ravier declared, for Ignatius, Jesus was God our creator and Lord, Lord, the name above all other names, by which the Father exalted the risen Christ, so that all beings in the heavens, on earth, and in the underworld should bend the knee, the name that every tongue should acclaim to the glory of God the Father. Every human word fails before the name, the name that Ignatius gave to his society, and by which, once and for all, he defined its spirit. 
Knowing and working with the servant of God, Father Hardin, one witnessed the fruit of the spirituality of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Father Hardin was tireless in the apostolate because it was Jesus Christ to whom he was giving himself in loving service. I recall my last visit with Father Hardin in mid-December of 2000, just two weeks before his death. Although illness had weakened him greatly, his one thought was what more he could do for our Lord for the greater glory of God. In saying farewell to Father Hardin, I knelt in front of him to get my ear close enough to his voice, which had become so weak. His final words to me were, Bishop, will you continue to work with me? Working with him meant advancing the mission of our Lord Jesus Christ, striving to know Christ more deeply in order to love him more truly and to serve him more faithfully. The servant of God was working with Christ to the end with the last energies of his earthly life. The spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola are the key to understanding the spirituality of St. Ignatius, the spirituality of the daily conversion of life to Christ, of giving oneself totally to Christ. St. Ignatius developed the spiritual exercises in reflection upon his own conversion which marked the beginning of a lifetime of striving to live always more fully in Christ. In other words, conversion is not an isolated moment, but a moment which by its nature extends throughout a lifetime. Regarding the spiritual exercises in the life of St. Ignatius, Father Ravier wrote, a conversion has always God's initiative as its origin. It is, like faith, a free gift of God. In the conscience of each man, be he an unbeliever or be he a sinner, the Holy Spirit makes the call heard, a call which is specified by the event, the opportunity, the interior motivation, or by a combination of all these means, a call which imposes itself spontaneously or launches a long debate in the heart of the man or which slowly mounts from the unconscious depths of the being up to a clear awareness. Ignatius knew this from personal experience at different stages of, of his life. He codified it in the rules regarding discernment of the spirit and selection in the spiritual exercises, and he referred to it in numerous spiritual letters. The spiritual exercises were therefore meant for all the faithful, and in fact, St. Ignatius saw the teaching of the spiritual exercises as a particular work of the Society of Jesus. As Father Ravier explains, the spiritual exercises for St. Ignatius are not an esoteric manual reserved for the initiated. They are a kind of spiritual catechism, which, as the dogmatic catechism, leads to faith, to hope, and to charity, leads one to live always more in faith, hope, and charity in the steps of Jesus Christ. Father Ravier concludes, for Ignatius, the spiritual exercises must be available to all spiritual persons, the humblest and the highest, the untaught and the cultivated. It was up to the director to adapt them to his retreatant, to choose, to develop, or to eliminate. 
From my very first work with Father Hardin, he continually emphasized with me the importance of the spiritual exercises for every member of the Marian Catechist Apostolate. In fact, in the very first stage of formation of a candidate for membership in the Marian Catechist Apostolate, it is required that the candidate make the spiritual exercises at home over the period of 30 days. The servant of God considered the spiritual exercises so important for the continuing conversion of life to Christ that he offered a popular guide for those who wished to make them at home. Communion with our Lord Jesus Christ for St. Ignatius of Loyola meant ready service of his vicar on earth. In discerning God's will and looking for the signs of God, St. Ignatius bound himself and his brothers in the Society of Jesus to the, to the service of the Roman pontiff as the supreme shepherd of the flock. About the bond between the Roman pontiff and the society, Father Ravier wrote, the first sign of God for Ignatius, actually the only incontestable one, the only one which presented no ambiguity for him, was the mission indicated by the vicar of Christ on earth. Let us divest these two words, mission and vicar of Christ on earth, from all the clinging nuances in which a certain literature has enveloped them. Let us give them all of their evangelical vigor, hard and pure. When the Pope formally assigned a task to the society or to a companion, he made again the gesture of Jesus Christ sending his apostles or his disciples on a mission. His order proceeded from the toil of the Spirit to work in the world, from the mission even of the Word incarnate among men. There is no question that Father Hardin wanted all of his service of the apostolate to be in the strictest communion with the Roman pontiff. Otherwise, it would no longer be service of Christ in his church. There are so many other aspects of the servant of God's formation as a Jesuit which merit our consideration. Once again, I express the hope that a biography or biographies of Father Hardin will help us to gain a fuller understanding of the essential part of his life as a priest of the Society of Jesus in his lasting legacy. One final aspect which must be mentioned is the central part of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the spirituality of St. Ignatius of Loyola and in the religious and priestly formation of the Servant of God as a member of the Society of Jesus. In his autobiography, St. Ignatius, recounting the story of his conversion, tells of a vision in which he saw clearly an image of Our Lady with the Holy Child Jesus. The vision of the Mother of God, in fact, inspired his conversion to Christ. Regarding the vision, his autobiography attests, from this sight, he received for a considerable time very great consolation, and he was left with such loathing for his whole past life, and especially for the things of the flesh, that it seemed to him that his spirit was rid of all of the images that had been painted on it. Thus, from that hour until August 1553, when this was written, he never gave the slightest consent to the things of the flesh. For this reason, it may be considered the work of God, although he did not dare to claim it, nor said more than to affirm the above. But his brother, as well as all of the rest of the household, came to know from his exterior the change that had been wrought inwardly in his soul. After his conversion, and after he was well enough to travel, 
he set out on his pilgrimage to Jerusalem, going first to the shrine of Our Lady at Montserrat, near Barcelona, at which he made his general confession, and on the eve of the Annunciation of Our Lord, gave up his fine clothing to a beggar, and clothed himself in the sackcloth tunic and sandals of a pilgrim. That night he went to Our Lady's altar, and following the rites of chivalry, he spent the evening in, in a vigil of arms, kneeling and standing the whole night through. At dawn, he offered his sword and dagger to Our Lady, hanging them on the chapel wall. Inigo, Ignatius in the Basque language, De Leola, was now Our Lady's night. Wanting to give himself completely to Jesus Christ, to God the Son incarnate, Saint Ignatius turned to the Mother of God, seeking her intercession that he might give up his life as a worldly soldier to become a spiritual soldier in the unconditional service of her divine Son. Like Saint Ignatius, likewise, Saint Ignatius attests to his constant prayer to the Blessed Virgin Mary from the time of his priestly ordination that she intercede to unite him with her son. After his priestly ordination, St. Ignatius, in fact, spent an entire year without saying Mass, preparing himself and praying Our Lady to deign to place him with her son. In the whole life and spirituality of St. Ignatius, Devotion to the Mother of God is seen as the way to knowledge and love of her Divine Son. The autobiography of St. Ignatius attests, He also had many visions when he said Mass, and when he was drawing up the Constitutions too, he had them very often. He can now affirm this more easily, because every day he wrote down what went on in his soul and he had it now in writing. He then showed me a rather large bundle of writings, of which he gave me a good bit. Most were visions that he saw in confirmation of some of the constitutions, at times seeing God the Father, at times all three persons of the Trinity, at times Our Lady who interceded, and at times confirmed. Giving himself totally to our Lord Jesus Christ, St. Ignatius invoked unceasingly the intercession of the Mother of the Savior and sought to follow her in the total union of his heart, like her Immaculate Heart, with the glorious, pierced heart of Jesus. For the member of the Society of Jesus, communion with our Lord Jesus Christ necessarily comes by way of the Mother of God, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who gave birth to God the Son at Bethlehem and unfailingly draws all men to her divine Son in the Church with the instruction which she gave to the wine stewards at the wedding feast of Cana when she sent them in their need to her Son. Do whatever he tells you. I would now like to comment directly on the lasting legacy of Father Hardin. Having reflected at length on the fonts of the lasting spiritual legacy of Father Hardin, it is now possible to indicate some principal aspects of the action of divine grace in his life for the service of Christ and of his mystical body. Perhaps the most effective way of speaking about the spiritual legacy of the servant of God is to study the apostolates which he founded and which continue under his inspiration and with his intercession to serve Christ and the Church. The Marian Catechist Apostolate will serve as the prime example, but what is said of the Marian Catechist Apostolate can also be said about each of the apostolates which Father Hardin either founded or cooperated in founding. 
While it is appropriate to view his spiritual legacy from the perspective of the apostolates, one must not forget the countless individuals who had recourse to the servant of God for spiritual counsel and direction. Faithful to the graces of his religious and priestly vocations, Father Hardin was tireless in the care of souls. In a particular way, he cared for the many devout souls who suffered greatly from the false and contrary implementation of the teachings of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council. For example, vacuous and erroneous catechesis regarding the faith and morals and liturgical abuses which obscured or, in extreme cases, eliminated the action of Christ in the celebration of the sacraments. In his book, Spiritual Life in the Modern World, Father Hardin commented on the anguish of many devout Catholics in our time. He wrote, No one who knows what is happening in the Catholic Church has any doubt that the faith of millions of believers is on trial today. Nor is this any ordinary trial that some would lightly dismiss as the usual situation that follows a general council. Nor can we merely say that there is a cultural revolution and the Church was bound to be affected by the spirit of the times. There is the anguish of so many dedicated Catholics often looking vainly for a priest that they can easily confess to, of others looking for a school or religious education program to which they can entrust their children safely, of still others looking and not finding some church somewhere that offers a holy hour or a novena or still has benediction service. Countless souls found in Father Hardin a secure source of sound doctrine and spiritual counsel. The greatest spiritual legacy of the servant of God is a life lived in Jesus Christ for the greater glory of God. Even as in his own priestly life, he sought to know, love, and serve Jesus Christ alone, so also he taught others to do the same in accord with the demands of their vocation in life. Observing the great confusion and error also within the Church in the present time, Father Hardin frequently reminded all of the faithful that they must prepare themselves to suffer greatly, even to undergo martyrdom, in order to be faithful to the teaching of Christ in His Church. And in his introduction to the Marian Catechist Manual, the Servant of God wrote, Catholicism is in the throes of the worst crisis in its entire history. Unless true and loyal Catholics have the zeal and the spirit of the early Christians, unless they are willing to do what they did and to pay the price they paid, the days of America are numbered. Father Hardin remained confident in the abiding presence of Christ with the Church and with her individual members through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, although he saw clearly the gravity of the situation and the greatness of the demands of Christian life in our time, he was confident that with the grace of Christ, Catholics would give the faithful witness to Christ, which transforms individual lives and indeed the world. In his book, Spiritual Life in the Modern World, in which the servant of God sets forth in a clear way the meaning of our communion with Christ in his suffering, passion, and death, he quoted St. Ignatius, his father in God, about the need to ask God in prayer for sufferings in order that the love of God might grow in our hearts. Father Hardin then commented, the trouble with quotations like this from the mystics is that we are liable to think that they were unlike ourselves. Not so. They shrank from sacrifice and the cross as much as we do. 
But here precisely is the secret of sanctity. It is possible through divine grace for the love of God to reach a degree in our hearts where we experience joy in suffering. Honest, really. And it is a taste of this joy which the Savior promised to all who sincerely strive to become like him by embracing what he embraced, the cross. He out of love for his Father, we out of love for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The cost of loving God is high, but God comes through. He rewards the price we pay with an experience of his presence, a sense of his intimacy, and a joy that the saints tell us is so sweet that they would not exchange their sufferings for all the pleasures in the world. Let us ask our Savior to not just listen or hear what those who learn to love God tell us, but to teach us from experience that this great wisdom is true. The servant of God was realistic about the high price to be paid for remaining faithful to Christ, but at the same time he was confident in the help of God's grace to make us wise and strong in paying the price, no matter how high, and to give us the consolation of an ever deeper communion with Christ in his suffering and dying, which leads to his rising from the dead. The apostolate, bringing Christ to others. Inseparably, inseparably connected with the central place of Christ in the spiritual legacy of Father Hardin is his insistence on the mission of all Catholics to communicate Christ to others to the world. He understood deeply that the communion of hearts with the Sacred Heart of Jesus necessarily transformed hearts, making them the channels of Christ's love for others. All of the apostolates which Father, Har Father Hardin founded or helped to found in some way helped to make Christ known and loved by others. Regarding the Marian Catechist Apostolate, Father Hardin declared, the key work in the Apostolate of the Marian Catechists is to make God known through Christ so that knowing God, people might love him and loving him might serve him and serving him might save their souls. Father Hardin repeatedly reminded Catholics and especially participants in his apostolates that they are to be, in his words, living witnesses to their faith in Christ and thus become channels of believing grace to other people. For Father Hardin, the apostolate, therefore, could never be reduced to activity alone. It was rather an activity founded upon an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, especially through the sacraments of the Holy Eucharist and confession and through daily prayers and devotions. Father Hardin's dedication to the apostolate was fully guided by the teaching of the Church, which we find expressed in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And I quote, Christ sent by the Father is the source of the Church's whole apostolate. Thus the fruitfulness of apostolate for ordained ministers as well as for lay people clearly depends on their vital union with Christ. In keeping with their vocations, the demands of the times, and the various gifts of the Holy Spirit, the apostolate assumes the most varied forms. But charity, drawn from the Eucharist above all, is always, as it were, the soul of the whole apostolate. The servant of God insisted that one can only communicate Christ to others or be a channel of his grace for others if he first strives to know and love Christ ever more deeply and fervently each day. Regarding the catechist, for instance, Father Hardin wrote, whatever be the level of his responsibility in the church, every catechist must constantly endeavor to transmit by his teaching and behavior the teaching and life of Jesus. 
He will not seek to keep directed towards himself and his personal opinions and attitudes the attention and the consent of the mind and heart of the person he is catechizing. Above all, he will not try to inculcate his personal opinions and options as if they express Christ's teaching and the lessons of his life. Every catechist should be able to apply to himself the mysterious words of Jesus. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. The Marian Catechist Apostolate, therefore, necessarily is twofold in its scope. First, it aims to develop a strong spiritual life in the catechist. That is, it aims to draw the catechist into a deeper communion with Jesus Christ through frequent participation in Holy Mass, daily if possible, regular confession, and daily prayers and devotions. In the second place, it aims to provide a doctrinal formation so that the catechist may communicate Christ in all of the richness of his life in the Church. When urging Catholics to share in the sufferings of Christ for the salvation of the world, the Servant of God underlined that our sufferings bring salvation to the world only to the degree that they are united to the love of Christ. First, he made clear that at the heart of our life in Christ is the cross when he wrote, Finally, and this should be the main lesson we ought to learn from the passion of Christ today in the sufferings of his mystical body, the real meaning of Christianity is to be found in the cross. A Christian is one who embraces this cross. He, however, also made it immediately clear that the cross and suffering and crucifixion, Christ's and ours, have only as much meaning as we have faith and love. The spiritual exercises. All of the apostolates of Father Hardin are imbued with the spirituality of St. Ignatius of Loyola, his father in religion. It is not a kind of implicit spirituality, but a spirituality which Father Hardin made explicit, teaching it to those who would work with him in the apostolate. As mentioned above, the first stage of candidacy to become a member of the Marian Catechist Apostolate involves the making of the spiritual exercises at home over a period of 30 days. Father Hardin understood that most of those who would join him in the apostolate could not take 30 days away from home to make the spiritual exercises at a retreat house. He therefore worked to find a practical way for those desiring to enter the apostolate to make the spiritual exercises. The spiritual exercises by their very nature are not made once but give a continuous direction to one's life in Christ. For that reason, Father Hardin placed great emphasis on the regular renewal of the spiritual exercises, especially through an annual retreat. I recall so well the energy with which he invested himself in the annual retreats of the members of the Marian Catechist Apostolate, even though he was already of an advanced age and suffering from serious illness. I remember well, too, the great joy which was his in discovering the priest of Milus Christi, who, after he had examined them carefully, found that they knew deeply the spiritual exercises and had the preparation to communicate the spiritual exercises to others. Connected with the spiritual exercises are the many other spiritual practices which Father Hardin urged to foster the daily conversion of life, the daily examination of conscience with an act of contrition, daily spiritual reading and daily meditation, the regular reception of the sacrament of confession, and the daily making of the way of the cross. In accord with the mind of St. Ignatius of Loyola, Father Hardin made every effort to, develop, to adapt the spiritual exercises 
to the needs of those who sought his spiritual direction or engaged with him in one of his apostolates. Total loyalty to the Roman pontiff. Another important aspect of the spiritual legacy of the servant of God is total loyalty to the Roman pontiff as the vicar of Christ on earth. As he had learned in his home and from his father in religion, St. Ignatius of Loyola, the teaching and directives of the Roman pontiff are a sure sign of God's will for us. Communion with Christ in the apostolate is necessarily communion with his mystical body under the pastoral care and governance of the Roman pontiff. The Roman pontiff is the perpetual and visible source and foundation of the unity both of the bishops and of the whole company of the faithful. Father Hardin insisted on daily prayer for the Holy Father and his, his intentions, especially through the morning offering of the apostleship of prayer on the study of the most important papal documents and on the preparation to give an account of papal magisterium to those who do not know it or do not understand it. As a true Jesuit, Father Hardin was always ready to accept any mission from the Holy Father, as he did, for example, in preparing the missionaries of charity of Blessed Teresa of Calcutta to be catechists. Devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Central to the spiritual formation for the apostolate is strong devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Mary brought the Savior into the world. She was the first to communicate him to the world. Faith in the redemptive incarnation and strong devotion to the Mother of God, the privileged instrument of the same mystery, are inseparable aspects of life in Christ. Regarding the role of Mary in the catechesis of young people, for example, Father Hardin wrote, their minds must be enlightened so their hearts will be inspired. In fact, inspiration without sound doctrine is fanaticism. Part of this sound instruction must be in the mysteries of Our Lady, who first gave Christ to the world and who is still giving her son to those who believe in him and tells them as she told those servants at the wedding feast in Cana, do whatever he tells you. This is Mary's message to the world. The servant of God gave to the Marian Catechist Apostle as its motto, the words of the Blessed Virgin Mary at the wedding feast in Cana, do whatever he tells you. Father Hardin placed the Marian Catechist Apostolate under the patronage of Our Lady of Guadalupe, Mother of America and Star of the New Evangelization. I shall never forget the joy and hope which he manifested in visiting the site of what has become the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe at La Crosse. He hoped, in a providential way, that it would be the center for the apostolate. He insisted on taking a rough ride to the top of the bluff, which was to be the site of the church of the shrine. And there, thanks be to God, he blessed the ground on which that church now stands. And I cannot help but think, given the many difficulties involved in the development of the shrine and the building of the church, that that blessing continued with prayers and intercession on the part of the servant of God. In the mystical body of Christ, the Virgin Mary continues to bring Christ to all whom Christ, as he died on the cross, entrusted to her as true sons and daughters. She is both the model of life in Christ and at the same time the first among all intercessors for the faithful that they may live in Christ. For catechists, the servant of God identifies three qualities of the Blessed Virgin Mary, whom he calls the perfect communicator of the revelation of her divine Son, which he invites the catechists to imitate. The qualities are Mary's clear and unquestioning faith, 
Mary's union in prayer with the heart of her Son, and Mary's plain and courageous living out of the will of God in her life. One of my lasting impressions of the servant of God was his constant companionship with the mother of God. For example, every time we traveled together, even for the shortest distance, he always first prayed the Hail Mary and invoked the help of Our Lady of the Way, the Madonna della Strada, venerated in the Jesuit Church of the Jesu in Rome. And then he used whatever time, even if it be a matter of only minutes, to pray some part of the Holy Rosary. Father Hardin insisted on the daily praying of the Holy Rosary and the praying of the Angelus at least twice a day as staples of the spiritual life. Conclusion For the greater glory of God, it is my hope that these few reflections in some way point to the remarkable lasting legacy which the servant of God, Father John A. Hardin, S.J., has left to the Church, and in a particular way to those dedicated to the apostolate. It is my hope that these reflections have opened up both the great richness of his own spiritual life, which he so generously and tirelessly shared with others, and the essential aspects of the spiritual life which he lived and taught. Life in Christ, especially through the sacraments of the Holy Eucharist and penance, the spiritual exercises and other spiritual practices, the apostolate, total loyalty to the Roman Pontiff, and devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. In the end, the lasting legacy of Father Hardin to us is a deeper knowledge and love of our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son incarnate. It is love of divine love incarnate. It was not by chance that the first page of text of the Marian Catechist Manual is the prayer Anima Christi, which expresses so fully the legacy which Father Hardin wanted to leave us, namely, belonging totally to Christ in every fiber of our being throughout the days of our earthly pilgrimage and reaching the goal of our pilgrimage in the kingdom of God, in the company of all the saints, praising and glorifying God for all eternity. Before concluding, I beg you to become involved with the work of the cause for the beatification and canonization of the servant of God, John Anthony Hardin of the Society of Jesus and to support generously the work of the cause. For through the work of the cause, the lasting legacy of Father Hardin will extend to many faithful for the salvation of their souls. I close with the words of the servant of God taken from his book, Spiritual Life in the Modern World. My God, we are prompted to pray, is it possible for weak human nature to rise to these heights? Can we really love in this selfless way? His answer to us is the reply the angel gave to Our Lady. Nothing is impossible to God. What we cannot do, He can achieve in us and through us by the power of His grace. True love is not a theory. It is not poetry or pious fancy. It is a reality, the reality of a person who became man and dwells among us. In this love, we can all have a share, provided we allow incarnate love to take over the mastery of our hearts. Thank you very much for your patient attention to a rather long, if you can believe it, I took out some things. But it, <laughs> I appreciate very much your patient attention. I hope in some way that it has honored the 
the memory of Father Hardin, but more so has drawn our attention to the great gift which he continues to be for us in the church. God bless you.